bear with him. And if anyone had any questions, we can hear you now. I'll speak. Shadid, if you can um, just request to come on. Technical issues, Bismillah. Okay. Can you see in here now? Very nice and clear. Okay, great. Alhamdulillah. Okay, inshallah. Bismillah rahman rahim. Um, Jazakallah for being here. I know you're a busy man. Yeah. My audience is 99% um, uh, women, and most of them are mothers and single mothers. And we've got a few questions for you, inshallah. Um, as I was introducing you, I just had come across you, alhamdulillah, from the conversations from the Quran. And I really enjoyed this discussion that you talked about Maryam alayhi salam, you know, between Belkis and Prophet Suleiman. And you're talking about what I picked up from your conversations where you're talking about the intergenerational traumas and you're talking about mindset and you're talking about toxic relationships. And you're particularly talking about like unhealthy attachments and healthy attachments. So, um, inshallah, if you don't mind, because most of my audience don't know you, if you could share um, a little bit of who you are and what you're passionate about and kind of your background and why this topic is important to you. Okay. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al wal mursaleen wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een. Thank you, Sister Khadija, for um, reaching out and uh, extending the, this generous invite to your page, to your platform, to your audience. Um, I'm, I'm humbled by the opportunity. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we can all, for the time that we have, that we can all benefit from uh, the information that's going to be shared here. Uh, just a little bit about myself, not to go into too much detail, uh, but um, <clears throat> I am a graduate from the Islamic University of Medina um, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, where I studied um, my concentration, my tachassus was uh, hadith, prophetic traditions. Um, I graduated from the College of Hadith uh, in 2007. Uh, returned back to America and just kind of trying to fill a void. Um, that's that's all. I, I don't profess to be a scholar. I don't profess to be a sheikh. I don't profess to be any of that. Just trying to fill a void that I see in our community um, that... Mm -hmm. Dealing with domestic issues. When I mean domestic issues, I'm talking about marriage, divorce, raising children. These are domestic issues that I saw as a new Muslim that there wasn't a lot of talk about uh, mental, yeah. mental health issues. I saw that there were a lot of, you know, main mainstream talks on, you know, Salat and, you know, being a better Muslim and hijab and yeah. all of these different talks, which are great talks. But there was a huge neglect as it relates to the domestic issues that make up, you know, mm -hmm. you know, the foundation of any community. You know, if you're going to have a yeah. community, then you have to address those, you know, those key issues that help to build the foundation. And those are domestic issues. And so that has become <clears throat> my target, my target for a long time. Um, I infuse, obviously, a lot of Tawheed and, you know, all of the other, you know, mainstream, mm -hmm. mainline topics. But... I don't single those topics out as a matter of discussion. I infuse those mm -hmm. into the domestic issues that I talk about. So you'll hear Tawheed, you'll hear, you know, Tawakkul, you'll hear all of the other, you know, mm -hmm. beliefs that we have in our religion, but they are infused in the domestic issues that I am addressing, that I'm attempting to address. All right. So I have been involved in, um, you know, um, these uh, domestic issues, mental health issues. I actually started my master's degree some years ago um, dealing with mental health issues. And um, um, uh, it was actually my tahasso. So my specialty was um, um, leadership in uh, social services. So in studying, you know, going through leadership and social services, obviously we had, um, I had a class dealing with psychology. I had a class dealing with um, uh, children and social services. So, and I, I'm a product of that as well. You know, I grew up in a foster home system. So I was a product of that as well. So I took a liking to this, obviously, because it was something that was very important to me. And you yeah. know, there were issues that I were, you know, I was dealing with. 
And I'm still trying to, you know, make sense of a lot of things that, you know, have happened to me in my life growing up. And I just found a way to infuse all of that into, you know, my teachings, you know. So that's that's pretty much in a nutshell, you know, who I am and why. I, I think that's definitely what I picked up from your conversations that you were adding, not just the psychology, but it was like there's lived experience here. There's some wisdom behind, you know, the test and, and that's what builds your resilience. What I love from what you're saying is that you have you talk about very openly about the mental health and the mindset and the healing and attachments and I think that's such an important now a big aspect of my my clientele is a lot of the audience here are sisters that are single mum single mothers whether by for whatever reason whether right. the husband's incarcerated or you know they've been divorced from left a domestic violence situation or they've gone through um for whatever reason, and they're raising their boys, right? right? And this is an area that is 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 such a huge responsibility because you know we you know better than I that you know uh, the most ideal for an umma is a thriving home where you do have ideally a healthy, emotionally healthy father and mother. Absolutely. I wanted to just start speaking a little bit about that, um, particularly for this area because this is an area probably that. Most women are struggling who are single mothers who are raising their sons. They also have a bit of their own trauma. They can also be sending messages to their sons from their own man wounds that they've experienced. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to me a little bit of what you feel is the issue here and what do you feel in your line of work is so crucial to address here, particularly to single mothers? Let's start with in that area. Um, okay. Um, this is such a broad topic. Um, last night, I'm just kind of in my head mulling over, like, where do I begin? Where do I start? How do I avoid, you know, because addressing single mothers, uh, I'm a product of a single mother because at some point I did go and live back with my mother for the short time that I did live with her. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, I, and I know that I was a lot to deal with. You know, I came with a lot because I had been through a lot. And there was no yeah. way that my mom, being my biological mother, she was equipped to deal with everything that I came with, you yeah. know. Um, and so, you know, addressing, you know, single moms, raising boys in particular, um, it's a very touchy sub subject because usually single moms are, are very, very sensitive to criticism. Um, very sensitive yeah. to, you know, critique, even if it's constructive, you know, because they feel like in their minds, I'm doing the best that I can. And in doing the yes. best that you can, sometimes you use that as a defense mechanism not to accept constructive criticism. And no matter how well you think that you are doing, if someone were to ask you, honestly, is there room for improvement? We would all say yes. We would yeah. all say, you know, undoubtedly, we would say yes. So if there's room for improvement, then why can't you accept the constructive criticism when it's given to you? The criticism is not given to you to break you down or to destroy you or to dismiss everything that you have offered your child. But it's to also acknowledge the effort, but also to highlight the areas of improvement. And, and we can all use some, you know, some critique as it relates to the areas that we need to improve on. And I think one yeah. of the things, one of the things, so I, I want the sisters who are single, who are raising their sons, raising their children by themselves, I want you to be a bit objective as you listen. Not to be defensive, because if you are defensive and you put up your defenses, then you're going to miss the message. You're going to miss mm -hmm. the message because you're so busy worried about not crumbling that you are not hearing the things that are actually going to be, you know, help to cement those pieces and build you back up. So the first thing that I would say as a, as a woman raising children by themselves is that you have to be aware of your own trauma. Because, because you may be imposing your trauma onto your children without even realizing it. Yeah. And if you have been through traumatic experiences in childhood... The first step in help, uh, helping you to get over some of those things or to navigate your way through some of those things is to acknowledge that they exist. You know, yes. we, we've all had, you know, we've dealt with some toxic parents, you know, and and I say yes. toxic parents and I'm saying that, you know, not in a derogatory or demeaning way towards our parents. Our parents were just doing the best that they could with what they had. 
and, and they didn't have a lot. So let me give you some examples of toxic parenting so that we can begin now. This is, we're going to kind of, we're going to kind of scaffold our conversation here. So we'll yeah. start with, you and know, the you can also look a little bit at the elements of what a dysfunctional family is as well. Right. Yeah. Right. So let's look at some exam examples of toxic parenting. You have the narcissistic parent, right? And many of, if your parent was born around the 50s, 60s, you know, then they were definitely, without a doubt, they had some level, some degree of toxicity uh, and narcissistic um, personalities. And sometimes they didn't even realize it. It's not intentional. I don't think any parent brings a child into the world with the intention of destroying this child. You know, but if you are not aware of your own traumas, if you're not aware of your own, you know, your own issues, then you are going to do that by default. You know, um, one of the great scholars, Hassan al-Basri, he made a very profound statement. He said, Rahimallah, Rahimallah, Mari'in, Arafa Qadra Nafsa. You know, may Allah have mercy on the person who understands his own limits. You, under, you, you have a deeper understanding of yourself, you know. So the first, you know, parenting style that is, you know, toxic is narcissistic parenting, right? Narcissistic parenting. Um, this is the parent that is more so the authoritative, you know, um, authoritarian parent. You know, it's like, you know, my way is the only it's way. You know, yeah. my way is yeah. the only way. There is no other way yeah. to live your life except the way that I dictate to you. And then, of course, mm -hmm. when you're dealing with a narcissistic parent, you're dealing with emotional manipulation, mental manipulation. Yes. You're dealing with all different levels that come along with narcissistic be you know, yes. behavior. Then you have the dismissive parent, the parent who, you know, just completely ignores, you know, all of your feats, all of your successes, all of your striving, mm -hmm. all of your efforts, all of what you're doing because they're dealing with their own stuff. You know, so they're they, they don't have unavailable. right emotionally unavailable. Right. So there's this dismissive parenting. There is um, the parent who lives vicariously through their own children. And this is the parent mm -hmm. who I didn't go to college. So you're going to go to college. I didn't get married. So you're going to get married. And this is, of course, a codependent relationship. Right. Right. And that is what creates because they are prepping the child to be another version of themselves. You know, they're so how does that affect, can we just pause here, how would you say that affects raising sons in particular, when the parent is very much imposing their perception onto that son that this is how I want you to be raised, almost creating an outcome on them? Well, it's dismissive, number one, of the child's own personal aspirations. You know, the child wants to do what they want to do or the direction that they want to go. And rather than allowing them to explore that and then, you know, kind of come to the conclusion that maybe that's not a good choice on their own, we will superimpose on them that this is the direction that I want you to go. So it's emotionally stifling. It's dismissive um, of, of the personality and, you know, of the child themselves. And there's so much more that you can add to that. And it, it creates a codependency because now the child is functioning in a realm that you created for them. And they only know how to do what you tell them to do. So there, there's this codependency, you know, emotional codependency, which, you know, doesn't allow them to, you know, survive in the world on their own. You know, this is the, the, the son who marries a woman who constantly refers back to his mom for direction in the smallest, yeah. most, smallest, most infinitesimal matters of his life. That he should be, he should have been equipped to be able to make those decisions on his own. But because his mom was there making all of those decisions for him, it, it stole his ability to make those decisions on his, on his own. So it's almost like she enables him to lose his ability to believe in his own ability to make a decision himself because he's always had to kind of, well, what does mom think or say? Right. Always looking for her validation, you know. So the, the parent who lives vicariously through their own children. And then, of course, there's the uh, passive parent. Is that the parent that just kind of allows the kid? You The passive parent comes to this point when they feel like, especially with moms and dealing with sons, you, you feel like there's nothing more that you can do for him. So you just give up. 
and you just let him do him. You know, he talks to you any type of way he wants to. He comes and goes as he pleases. This is obviously dealing with the older, more teenage, you know, in the teenage years. Yes. You've given up. So now you've resorted to passive parenting. And this is going to hurt him in the long run because we live in a world that is surrounded by choices that come with consequences. Mm. And a child that is not disciplined grows up to be a, an adult that is undisciplined. And that's There's a very message dangerous. you're sending to that child. Right. You've given them everything because you want to pacify them. You know, they start crying, you hand them the tablet. You start crying, you hand them your cell phone. They start, you know, whining of this, and then you, you start to feel guilty. So the child is making you feel guilty because you are not giving them what they want at the time that they want it. So then you feel guilty. Yeah. You go, you give in, you give it to them. You are sending the message that all they have to do is throw a temper tantrum. All they have to do is get angry and upset and they will get their way. And the world, mm -hmm. unfortunately, does not work like that. It doesn't yeah. work like that. And you're teaching that you're stealing their ability to be self-disciplined because you give in to everything that they want and you don't have to. You know, it's OK for a child. And this is one of the things that I wanted to mention is that sometimes we com children confuse love with parameters or they confuse, you know, hatred with parameters. Meaning when I tell you no, that that is an indication, especially with this day and time. If you tell the child no, then that is an indication that you don't love them. It's like, no, well, I, I'm I, telling you no because I love you. Yeah, and I find in, in coaching women and, and programs of women, women themselves are afraid to say no because they, they've conditioned their love or worthiness to their, to their child, particularly their son. So if they say no to their son and their son has a, gets upset, it's like they get guilty about that because they've conditioned their connection of their worthiness and their parenting to their child. So it's like, if my child's happy, I'm happy. Right. And that's not, right. not what we want, that right. person. Right. And one of the things that helps to create emotionally mature boys that become adults is to give them control over their emotions. I say to my sons all the time, I get it. You're in your feelings. That's fine. But that yeah. does not change my decision. My decision is still no. I'm not going to yeah. take your I'm not going to take away your ability to feel mad, angry, upset. Those are your emotions. That's fine. That's yeah. fine. I have to live with that, <laughs> but it's okay. Yeah. I, I'm okay with living. You're not going to shame me or guilt trip me into giving into what you want. I'm not going to do that. You're about, you're validating the emotional state, but you're also saying that I, I understand you're struggling with this and I know you're upset with this, but this is the rule. Yep. You're holding the limit. Right. Right. Yeah. And and consistency, you know, and that's another thing with um, single parenting, you know, whether with moms or dads, but moms in particular, since that's our, tor our target audience, is that you have to be consistent. I notice even with my own family that, you know, sometimes we'll say no or the, the dad comes in as a disciplinarian, as the rule setter. And then what the what the mom does here again, that guilt. Oh, you know, can you give him his phone back? And it's just like, no, I'm not going to give him his cell phone back. Like, I have a thing in my house. If you wake up late for Salat al Fajr, I'm taking your phone. Mm -hmm. You lose your phone. That's it. Um, and so it teaches them to value the Salat. If you value your phone, you value the privilege of having a phone, then you must be responsible with that. And part of the responsibility that comes along with having a phone is not just looking at things that are inappropriate on your phone, but also maintaining your Salat, maintaining your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And once you show that you are not mature enough to maintain that, then you are not mature enough to have a phone. I'm going to take that from you. And so what happens is, he mopes around the house for a while. Mom sees that he's moping. He's not in a good mood. He's not in a good space. And then mom comes to me and says, you, you think he can get his cell phone back? I, I think you've had it for a long enough time. And it's just like, here again, that break. It ha there has to be consistency. Even the Prophet Wasallam, he said, the most beloved deeds to Allah are the deeds that are done consistently, even if they're small. Adwamuha wa in qalla. A dawam, a dawam out of shape. You have to be consistent. You can't say something and then turn around, you know, an hour later, two hours later, and then break that. Because when you do that, 
you are sending the wrong message. You're sending the message that here again, all I have to do is display that I am emotionally distraught and then she'll give in. But the world doesn't work like that. So you're sending the, a horrible message to this child. It's almost like nasty, nasty. It's like, you know, you're going to chuck your tantrum, you'll get your way type thing. And, and it's, it's not, it, like you said, it's not sending the right message to that child. Right. Um, you know, when you talked about like getting up for five jokes example, when you have, and I mean, this is for girls and boys, but how do we help our boys in partic particular, especially as they become teenagers, to not lose that connection to Allah SWT. Like, what do you think with everything that's going on around them, what do you think is a crucial element to build in our boys from young? Because, you, you know, no point, it's, it's harder when you start as, as you as you start later. But what do you think is a crucial element to nurture that iman in that child so that by the time they are a teenager, their intrinsic motivation to make salat, their intrinsic motivation to to um, be, identify with Islam. What do you think is, is, is in your mind, comes to your mind when I ask that question? Well, I think that in order to keep a child connected to Islam or connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that has to start with the parents. That has to start with the mom and the dad or the mom or the dad, depending on what their living situation is. And that means small conversations. Like I'm a teacher. So sometimes when parents come to pick their children up from the school, they want to stop you and they want to, you know, hey, um, how's my child doing in class? And it's just like, no, it doesn't work like that. You want to schedule an appointment? I'll have a conversation with you, but you're not going to yes, just yes, pull yes, me to the side yes. and ask me that. And I, my yeah. question is, how do you think your child is doing? You know, what do you see the results of the child when you pick them up? And I tell parents all the time, the best way to see where your child is um, in their relationship with Islam is to have a conversation about what they, they covered in school. You don't have to sit down and do homework with them. In many instances, they understand the homework assignment on their own because the homework is just a follow up of what we covered in class. So they already know that. Yeah. What you need to do is when you pick your child up, hey, what did you guys learn in Islamic studies today? Hey, teach me something. You're my teacher. When I pick you up, you become my teacher. <laughs> Tell me something that you learned in Islamic studies today. And even if it's something that you already knew as a parent, you are showing the child like, wow, I didn't know that. Wow. Like you just... You just taught me something. You are teaching the child now through this conversation, through this engagement, that Islam is important to you. Children consider yeah. what is important to them based upon what yes. is important to the parent. And they pick up hypocrisy pretty quickly in action. So they, they look at our actions, not our Absolutely. words. Absolutely. You want a child to be yeah. interested in Islam, you have to be interested in Islam. Mm. You have to show an interest in the religion if you don't show an interest in the religion, it's just like I drop you off at school, Islamic school. I come and pick you up. I say nothing to you about what you covered in Islamic studies. I say nothing to you about anything. I don't show up at events at the school that, you know, that involve you engaging your classmates or engaging. I don't show an interest in it. Then the children eventually will stop showing an interest in it. See, what I'm hearing from you is showing an interest in your child, showing that they're capable, you know, really sending this message that I'm connected. I'm actually interested in what you think, what you, you're already opening a safe space with them from a very young age Absolutely. to connect in those conversations. It actually reminds me of, um, I think what I realized why I was so drawn to conversations from the Quran. Um, my mother's a revert. My mom's the Irish Aussie revert. And uh -huh. my mother, one of the biggest things growing up was as a Christian Catholic, becoming Muslim, well, she didn't know a lot about, you know, the, she couldn't read the Quran properly in Arabic, right? But she would tell us the stories of the, mm -hmm. of the Bible and the Quran. And, and so we grew up with this intrinsic love for the prophets because mm -hmm. my mother would sit with us in her pretty much around us and describe how beautiful Isa alayhi salam wow. is or how Ibrahim. And I think that, that was what built our our connection it wasn't so much like just to read quran as in just to pronounce you saw that like she it. had an interest you saw her she interest and her love for it, for it right? yes 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 and seeing my mother have such a love for islam it was like there was no mention growing up of haram there was no in our young minds all it was was allah is so loving like we heard the basically raising this idea that 
we, you know, Ola loves you. And mm-hmm. this was very important, I think, and she did a really good job in raising nine of us wow. in that, that first 10 years that she really, uh, she genuinely had that love. Like my mother never not had the Quran in her hands. And she could, she could, uh, she only learned how to read the Arabic Quran until she was a lot like a lot older, like we were quite much, much older. But I think she did something that was so important for us is she built our connection to who Allah is and that love for the prophets and the sahabas through storytelling, mm-hmm. through taking the stories and sharing with us. And I think the other thing is she built our tawakul. Mm-hmm. So she always talked about your trust in Allah. So we always felt from young this resilience or capability because it was almost like we always said the message, Allah has your back. Allah's mm-hmm. there for you. If I'm not here, trust in Allah. Right. Hesbin Allah will now more kill. And I think that was a big aspect. So I think that's, I just realized now why I was so drawn to your talks in Ramadan on conversations from the Quran. Because it's like, that's what it is. It's a lot of stories, but you learn and you connect to those conversations. And then you talk about conversations with our children. Right. How are children going to learn the deen is through our stories and conversations with them and mm-hmm. how much they see that we have that love for Islam. Even when you look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi interaction yeah. with the youth of the Sahaba, he never said, okay, grab the Quran or grab some something to write on, a loha, something to yeah. write on and sit down. And I'm going to teach you your religion the extent of his um uh teaching the his teaching with the youth of the sahaba was embedded in just simple conversations you find one yeah. hadith uh, uh abdullah ibn mas'ud is sitting on the back of a donkey with him and he says to abdullah ibn yeah. mas'ud in this very famous hadith do you know the right of allah over his creation and the right of the creation over allah or the right of allah over his servants and uh, uh, Abdullah bin Mas'ud said, uh, um, uh, Mu'ad, excuse me, Mu'ad bin Jabal, he said, I don't know, Allah and his messenger knows best. He said, the right of Allah over his servants is that they worship him alone and not associate partners with him. And the right of the servants mm-hmm. over Allah is that if they do that, he won't punish them. This is just a conversation mm-hmm. on the back of a donkey. That becomes yeah. a hadith that we are literally structuring our entire lives by, but it was just a simple conversation between an adult male and a young boy. The message I'm getting from you is that you as a parent have to love and live Islam as an everyday part of your life. This is going to be the, the most strongest example for your children. And, and children pick up. Like I've, I've, I've met many women that I've coached and they have a disconnect to Allah because of their parents' um misalignment of what they were saying and asking them mm-hmm. to do and what they themselves were practicing absolutely i think that's the start if you want to keep a child you know connected to islam connected to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you yourself have to be connected you yourself it's just like it's just like in a relationship if you want someone to love you a person will only love you in a marriage to the extent that you love yourself and you can't get yeah. frustrated with someone when you want them to love you more than what they are already loving you, but they have reached their capacity in loving you because that's the capacity that you have reached in loving yourself. Yeah. That you, you are, you are demanding from the person to love you more, but they cannot love you more because you don't love you more. When you start to show a more personal investment in yourself, self love yeah. and, you know, all of those things, then the person can increase and their capacity to love you because your cat, you know, your your ceiling has now grown. But if your ceiling is here very low, then the, once the person reaches that ceiling, there's not much more that they can, you know. So the same way we works with, pe- you know, go ahead. We teach people how they treat us. Yes. And you teach your children how they should love Islam by how much you love Islam. We have this, sometimes parents have this sick idea that I want my children to love Islam more than me. I want my children to go further than I've gone. Your children cannot go any further than you have gone if you do not create an environment whereby they can do that. You That is counterproductive thinking. I, I, I hear parents say that all the time. You know, you know this particular parent outside of school. You know that this this father, he smokes, he uh, he sells cigarettes in the corner store, bodega, whatever the case may be. Got it. No judgment. Just stating how it is. But then you put your child into Islamic school and then you say to me, I want my child to, you know, excel, you know, where I am. And I want my child to be a better Muslim than I am. How is that possible when the environment that you are creating for your child is a, a, is, is representative of how much you love Islam? <laughs> 
Mm. It doesn't work like that. That is counterproductive thinking. In order for your child to love Islam more than you do, then you have to you have to broaden the capacity wherein the child can you know love Islam more, and that starts with you. That starts with the environment. Um, coming over to fathers, what do you think is something practically important for a father that's raising a son that he can be sh building that bond of between him and his son, but also the Islamic bond? Of that love towards Islam. Uh, one of the things that I, I think is, I just kind of jotted, I wrote some notes down. Um, one of the things that fathers can do is that we have to learn how to calibrate our expectations as they develop through life experiences. Being flexible is key in effective parenting, you know, because we have to learn how to change with the changes of our child. Your child is not going to be seven, eight, nine, no matter how much we get comfortable with them in those years, they are going to go beyond that. You're going to look up one day and this boy is going to be into girls. You're going to wake up one day. This boy is going to be into, you know, no longer want to play video games, but want to be involved in other things. And you have to understand that, okay, I have to learn how to be flexible with the growth and development of this child. We tend to get caught in this in this zone, in this place where, OK, the child, I'm used to the child being like this. And then when the child shows, you know, an interest in something else or shows that they are moving in a different direction, then we want to pull the child back rather than embracing the growth and the development of the child and meeting them where they are. That's one of my favorite mm -hmm. slogans. My favorite teachings is meet learning how to meet people where they are. And this was one of the things that we learned from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, so I think we need to learn how to calibrate our expectations. We're saying, OK, well, he's Muslim. He should know better. OK, you're Muslim. You should know better. <laughs> right. We, you say that as if we don't commit sins as adults. We disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at the time that you disobeyed Allah, you knew better. So what makes you any different than this child? Yes, he is supposed to know better. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and especially your teenage boys, their brain development is still underdeveloped, Absolutely. interesterone levels, like, you know, like, we have to, we have to deal with them in, yes, like, not a soft nature, but are you saying that with our boys, we have to be not flexible. kind of take the high road? You gotta Pardon? be flexible, you have to be flexible. Yeah. You have to be, and I mean, yeah. the thing is, is that you know, let me just share something, just a, just a, a personal, personal note. So my oldest son, who's he's he's an adult now, but at the time he was like maybe 16, 17. And his boy, you know, some of his Muslim friends, they went and got tattoos, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, no, we're not having that. So That's not happening here. So he went and got his ears pierced. He went and got an earring. My son, he went and got an earring. And so um, he texts me and it was like, you know, is getting, I guess his mom kind of chewed into him was like, you know, are you crazy? You ain't got an earring. So he texts me and was like, um, is getting an earring haram? Is piercing your ears haram? And he was like, you know, here again, the, the male mind, that, that man, man logic, he's trying to make the connection between, well, if I got my nose pierced, what would be different than that in, the, in getting my ears pierced? So I said, listen, I'm not going to have this conversation with you over the phone. I said, when I get home, we'll have the conversation. So he came in, you know, I'm a barber, so I'm cutting his hair. And this is another way to connect with sons is that yeah. you're engaging them at a time. Like, for example, if you go out, you're playing basketball one on one with your son, but you're trying to have a conversation with him while engaging in something that he enjoys doing. Mm -hmm. So I said, listen, you know, getting an earring is hot on. I said, why? Because it's it's not for men to adorn themselves or beautify themselves in that fashion. All right. Our beautification is in other things, you know, but not getting an earring. That's usually for women. Yeah. I said, but I'll, here's the deal. He was like, well, I want to get my other ears, my other ear pierced, too. So it looks weird. I only got one earring, you know, and I want to get the other one pierced. I said, all right. So here's the deal. I said, I'm not comfortable with you doing this. I'm, I'm not mm. comfortable with this. I said, but what I will do is that if you get your other ear pierced, then we have to stop there and definitely never a tattoo. I said, so, mm. so, and here I'm picking my battles. Yeah. Because the earring I've thing, the, same the earring thing, he will grow out of the earring thing. I promise you, he'll yeah. grow out of that.
I have I yeah. still have the hole in my ear from when my ear was pierced as a kid, as yeah. a teenager. I, I've, yeah. I've not worn an earring in my ear since I can't remember. So you will yeah. grow out of that. I know that as a boy, you will grow out of that. But a tattoo. And you negotiated with him. I you negotiate. Him. Right there, you go. There yes. you go. I told him, if you get your other ears pierced, that's it. I said, I won't give you no flack about it. I'll never say to you it's haram or take it out, whatever the case may be. I'll close my lip on that. I said, however, if you do that, you can never get a tattoo. Ever. I said, is that you, a deal? You, you, yeah. And he yeah, said, he said, it, he yeah. said, all right, I, I, I'll agree to that. I said, never get a tattoo. Ever. I agreed to that. I'm not going to give you no crap about it. It is what it is. I got to accept that. I got to live with that. But tattoo out of the picture. He's like, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll agree with that. And alhamdulillah, this was maybe four years ago, five years ago. You know, alhamdulillah, no tattoos <laughs> as of now. <laughs> Completely understood, alhamdulillah. And the same thing happened when my son was 16 or 17. And the earring came out after a month. Mm -hmm. It was like, you know, they had to try it, do yep. it. And, have to try it, yeah. right. Then you got to yeah. understand that you are up as a parent, you're up against you know, his peers and what the peer yes. group, like teenagers, they learn, teenagers will, with especially boys, they withdraw less and less, more and more from their parents and they begin to learn through what's called peer, you know, peer learning. So they're yes. in their groups, they're in their, you know, and especially with social media, you know, especially with social media and they're communicating with one another on social media, they have this peer learning, peer to peer learning. And they, yeah, they yeah. start, they start to withdraw from the parents. These are the child, the children that are 14, 15. You go into the movies and they don't want to go anymore. Are you taking the kids to, you know, uh, you know, some sky zone or somewhere to go jump or whatever? They don't want to go anymore. They start showing yeah. less and less interest in what you do as a family, right? That means that they are withdrawing from you and they are more mm -hmm. in, in, to, in tune with their peers. So, and they're creating their own identity. And they're creating their own identity. And you have to understand, they're not going to go against their peers because these are the peers that they have to answer to, so to say, you know, when they come back around. And they don't want to get clowned. They don't want to get, you know, shamed. They don't want to, you know, they don't want to be made fun of. So you as a parent, and I, I can't understand for the life of me why is, as adults, we have lost sight of that. We we were once in that realm. We were once a part of that as well. And we know how that I, feels. I, yeah. yeah. I think there's a lot of judgment. And a lot of time we parent from our generation. And, and Ali Reda who said this, and please correct me if I'm wrong. You, you know, I, I always think about the saying, he says, do not raise your children how you were raised. Mm -hmm. Because they are raised from different generations. But what you're saying is, Minus the judgment, keep the connection and have those conversations with them because if not, you're going to lose them. You're just going to push them. What most parents do, they go into shaming, they go into this is haram, your uh, put downs, emotional abuse, and this pushes the child more and more away, which makes them lose hope even in worshipping a lot. You know, I, I meet young women in my work that they, they think they're such bad Muslims. Right. Yeah. So when you, when you, um, in regards, oh, I'm interested, you know, you talk about the healing of the parent, right? In regards to mothers and fathers and being aware of what mm -hmm. trauma they're passing on to their ch children. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me, and, and I'm really curious to know this. Um, my, my, I've had this conversation with my husband and I've had this conversation. I've seen this with my brothers and other people that were raised uh, with, as a single, from a single mother, right? And I really feel, looking at the men in my life, that the ones that were raised by a single mother and those that were raised with a father that they saw um, a good blueprint around treating other women, around how you act in your role as a man in, in life. Right. I feel like a lot of the time, boys that are raised by single mothers, when they become men, it's almost they've missed out on a certain blueprint of, of it's almost like they've got to find themselves and they struggle in their marriages or struggle in their in their roles in, in life because they there's something missing there that they didn't get to witness. Say, example, if they had a father that was showing them the blueprint, basically, of how you conduct yourself. When that's missing, what's so important to those men that feeling a bit lost or those young men 
that want, you know, to, before they have their own families and things like that. Not that a lot of people think, and but whoever's listening to this and this might might touch with them. What do you think is missing or important for them to acknowledge for themselves so they can have healthy relationships in raising their children? Great question. Um, for boys who didn't grow, and I was one of them, but the, the unique thing about me is although I was not raised with my biological father, um, I had foster parents. I was um, blessed and fortunate enough to have two foster parents, a, 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 a woman and her husband, whom, although he wasn't my biological father, he still represented the blueprint of what a man is in my life. Mm. You know, and he was that, you know, he got up, went to work, you know, took care of the house. You know, he did everything that a man is supposed to do. So although I did not regard him as my biological father, I had something to draw on, right? Yeah. I had something to draw on. So that was the, the, the blessing that, you know, I'm grateful for. And it reminds yeah. me of the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, alam yajidika yatiman fa'awa. Then we find you as an orphan and we gave you shelter. We gave you refuge, right? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never met his father. He never met his father. His father died six months before he was born. Right. His his mom was only in the first trimester of her pregnancy and his father was deceased. And so although he did not have his biological father, he had other men in his life that represented that blueprint. His grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, until he was eight and then he went to go live yeah. with his uncle, Abu Talib. You know, and, you know, he had people, he had older cousins like Ali's older brother, Jafar ibn Abi Talib. He had older men around him all the time. And so he's drawing from them. He's observing. He's yeah. watching them. And that's what a young man has to do in order for him to develop the, the identity that he, you know, is, is most comfortable with as a man. And he has to pull from all of the things that are around him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful. He never leaves us, you know, number one, understand something about Allah. God gives every single one of us a talent. Every mm. single human being has a talent. Whether they recognize it or not, whether they come into the realization that they have it, that is on them. But every single one of us is born with a talent. Whether they know how to sing, they know how to rap, they know how to draw, they know how to paint, they know how to play basketball, they're athletic, they're, you know, whatever. Every single human being has a talent. And the beauty of social media is that social media has now forced human beings to look within themselves and find that talent and then use it on social media to make a living for themselves. This is the beauty of social media, man, subhanAllah, that before the creation of social media, people had to just find themselves and then they had to apply themselves and then they had to, you know, see if the world would be willing to accept them as they were. And if not, then, you know, we stifle that and then we go and find something else that we work for the next 50 years in a job that we absolutely hate simply because the world wasn't ready to accept the gift that we had. You know, the divine gift that was given to us by God. Mm -hmm. But with social media, we don't have to do that anymore, you know. And the thing about having this gift is that it takes us a while before we figure it out. But mm -hmm. in order for a person to tap into that gift, they have to be able to draw on the experiences that are around them. And those experiences keep pushing them. You ever, you know, just kept ignoring your gift and then people will say, oh, you know, you're good at this. Whether you're good at cooking, right? You're good at cooking and you might doubt yourself and say, oh, I'm not that good. And every time somebody mm -hmm. tastes your food, they're like, this is absolutely delicious. You should open up a restaurant. You should do this. You should open up a food truck. And you're like, yeah, 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 I'm, I'm good on that. Right. Mm -hmm. And And eventually you hit this place, this light bulb goes off and you're like, I need to open up a restaurant, <laughs> you know what I mean? But your experiences have been pushing you in that direction anyway, you know, yeah. and it's just a matter of you catching up to, you know, the experiences that are, you know, that are all in front of you. And with young boys, they have to do the same thing. Every boy has the potential to be, you know, the man that, you know, that they would like to be. You have to be able to draw on your experiences, draw on the things that are around you, God wants the best for all of us. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not put us here and strip of strip us of everything that we need to make the, the quality of life that we desire. We have every single tool in our box that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us to create the life that we like. It just takes some of us longer time to reach it. And some people, unfortunately, never get it. They never come into that realization, which is why in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the highest mm. level of that is self-actualization. When yes. you actualize your potential, the sky is the limit. Yes. But you got to yes. go through all of the other steps to get to self-actualization. So what do you think is the crucial tool then for a mother to build that in her son? Because what I'm hearing from you is build the capacities, that strength-based parenting where you recognize as a mother, okay, I can see he's good at that, encourage him. So it's more like a strength-based approach where you, you're looking at the skills he has and if he shows an interest and you know he's good at it, that you you keep that, helping him to meet his potential there capability. Go. There you go. I, I, we organized a, a basketball event here with uh, Brother Muhammad Abdul Alim. Shout out to Hoop Finesse, my guy. He came here to Delaware um, about a month ago and he um, did a basketball event here. And I went live while we were on the basketball court just to kind of show everybody what was going on. And I, there was a couple of my children. They're not necessarily into basketball. My boys, they like football. But putting them on the basketball court with somebody who is experienced and teaching them skills and things like that. What I said was that the more access you give your child to opportunities, the more opportunities they have to choose or to explore and find what they really like. When you limit your child's access to other opportunities, then they only think that they can do one or two things because they haven't been exposed to anything else. My children, they go basketball, they do boxing, they do swimming, they do, they, I, I expose them to as much as my schedule will allow me to so that they have a plethora of opportunities to choose from, to find themselves. Mm. But if you're only giving your child one or two options, then they're very limited in the things that they believe that they can do, that they can excel at. You know, um, Biggie Smalls had a, a, a phrase that is very popular in, 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 you know, in, ghetto terminology you know you either slinging rock crack rock or you got a wicked jump shot in the ghetto people think that they can only do one or two things they can either sell drugs yeah. or they can be good at basketball those are the only two ways that you're going to make it out of that and that is there can be nothing further from the truth but the yeah, only but reason that they believe mindset. right it's a very limiting mindset where you believe that i can yeah. only do this or this and that's because there are no opportunities what you're reminding me of is, but there are, there is, when you said it's not opportunities, there are opportunities or they can't see it, they've limited themselves or there really isn't any opportunities. There are opportunities, they just don't have access. When you haven't okay. been exposed, it's the exposure. The exposure to yeah. a number of things, so now they yes. have a broader range to choose from. Um, it reminds me of, and I see this a lot in parenting with mothers, they parent from a place of fear. Boom. Parent from a place of there you anxiety. Go. There you go. Yeah. So those and Muslims, we have people. it. And Muslims, we have it the worst. Why? Because our fears are over exaggerated, albeit sometimes as a result of Islamic leadership. Everything is haram. Everything is haram. Yeah. So when you yeah. are preaching from a space where everything is haram, then you are instilling fear into the Muslim community. So therefore, we are operating from a place of fear, not operating from a place of the sky's the limit, you know? Yeah. So yeah. you have Islamic leadership, to be honest with you, you have Islamic leadership to blame for a lot of that. Because they preach from a place of fear. And would you say, um, Shek, that it's also this message that's kind of sent to our, especially our teenage boys, that they're troublemakers, we don't really want them around. There's almost like negative messages that are sent to our teenage boys. What do you think is so, um, what do you think is not helpful in kind of our teenage boys, the message as adults that we're sending to them that is not supporting them? Uh, rephrase the question. Let me, let me. When I see, it. when I look at, um, like, example, my local mosque. Mm -hmm. uh, I try to get in trouble for this. They don't like the kids around at Tarawih time. Like, they don't like the, when it's in uh -huh. Ramadan. Like, they don't, they don't really want children around, right. Right? right? But I grew up that 
like my father would take my brothers to the mosque. Like they had an intrinsic in, a connection to the masjid. And they'll right. come home. My boys will come home and I'll be like, you know, oh, they didn't let us in because they thought we were troublemaking or that. But they weren't, you know, they weren't doing anything. They were just decided that some old uncles decided that or older mm -hmm. people. Yep. Sometimes I feel like there's a message that's sent to our youth. It's almost like you're, you're guilty be before you're accused of being innocent. You yes. know, like you're, you're already up to no good. Yep, I agree. 100%. This actually happened with uh, two of my sons uh, right before school let out. So we have a basketball court on the um, on the school premises. And a lot of the, the students, you know, who've aged out, our school only goes up to eighth grade. So then the children, they go on to high school, whatever, but they still come back to the masjid. They still come back to the school, whether to come pick up their younger siblings or just to come hang out, whatever the case may be. And they always are drawn to the basketball court. So they like to go to the basketball court. So um, my, my, two of my sons, um, you know, they came on Friday. Usually they, their school let out. They go to public school. So their school let out earlier than the Islamic school. Mm -hmm. So I used to bring them for the last week of school. I would bring them to school with me. And, you know, they would play on the basketball court while school was yeah. in session. And so the principal, here again, these old uncles who, you know, <laughs> you know, you're guilty before you do anything. He's like, you know, I don't want them on the basketball court or whatever the case may be. And uh, and then when some other kids came, you know, they played on the basketball court. He didn't say anything to them. So obviously my children, African-Americans, they felt like, all right, we're being discriminated against because he told us yeah. not to go on a basketball court. But yet he let them go on a basketball court. He didn't say anything. So my wife, you know, contacted the principal and, you know, kind of have a conversation with him. Like, you know, we don't want our children to feel he's like, you know, well, I don't want anybody on a basketball court or whatever. the case. Yeah, but why are you doing that? You make the children feel yeah. like they are unwelcomed. Like that. Yes. And, and aside from because he didn't just do it to the African American kids, he just did it to all of the older kids who were not actually a part of the school. But the 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 kids in the school they like playing with them. Though these are their old yeah. classmates, they they were in school with them yeah. at one point or whatever the case may be. They enjoy playing with them, you know. And so it it does chase the children away from the masjid. It makes them like. Sometimes, you know, the kids go into the mosque uh, in the Musalla area and they run and they play. And then you'll have an older uncle who's like, you know, hey, sit down, sit down. This is a masjid. And it's just like, yeah, but where else are they supposed to play? <laughs> like, they're yeah. not they're not necessarily disturbing anyone. We have younger kids yeah. at home, uh, kids that are jumping on my back while I'm in Suju. Like, I'm used to this. I know how to turn, tune them out. And I get it. The older generation, they are not necessarily used to that. You take an uncle who's, you know, in his late 60s and 70s. He just want to come yeah. to the masjid and pray or whatever the case may be. But chasing the children away from the masjid or making them feel like they are unwelcomed is definitely something that leads to, you know, the children feeling like, well, I don't want to go to the masjid. I'm, I'm good. I don't well, want that, to. that sense of belonging is lost. That yes. sense of connection. And this yes. is the next generation. Yeah, and exactly yeah. what you said. Yeah. Um, it's interesting what you said because um, like I don't like I I sent my my fifteen year old son he's studying in Malaysia at the moment and um, it's something I don't really talk about because there's that judgment that you um, we live in a, a time where there's so much judgment on our youth and they like I've seen with my own boys they've had to kind of go through their own um, embracing of their own Islamic identity because. They've had not very good experience in the Muslim schools Absolutely. around just, just, you know, deciding that they're doing something wrong when they're not doing something wrong or, or things like that. Um, I, I, I want to just quickly step on the facts around, um, you talked about, you, you showed a book on your, um, on your Instagram. I think it was Crisis of Men or Crisis of Boys? Mm -hmm. The Boy yeah, Crisis. I can't remember the title of it. The Boy, boy crisis. crisis. Yep. And you, you, and I'm not sure what the talk was about. I did try and look for it, but you talked about, uh, Prophet Ibrahim al-Islam and him dealing with intergenerational kind of, uh, trauma or curse from his father. Can you talk a little bit about, so people here understand how, what in, what is like the intergenerational, generational traumas that are passed on? And what is so important about you as a parent acknowledging your own healing, acknowledging what you need to do? Why is that important in parenting? Because a lot of times we think the child's a problem. But what, what is it that, why is this important? Can you explain about how 
why inter- how what is intergenerational trauma and why is it important to acknowledge this as a parent and what you can do in your healing if even as a mother or as a father to better yourself so you're passing on to your children a different message not pain right so intergenerational trauma or generational trauma generational curses is you know the the more broader text that non-muslims use these are, you know, toxic, unhealthy behaviors that are passed down from one generation to the next. Sometimes, you know, intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. Uh, nonetheless, these behaviors are toxic. These are traumatizing. Sometimes they're emotional. Uh, sometimes they are physical. You know, sometimes they are mental, psychological. Um, nonetheless, they are passed down from one generation to the next. So, for example, in the case of Prophet Ibrahim, السلام, it was, you know, worshiping idols. And uh, mm-hmm. Ibrahim, السلام, just kind of took a different path. Although his father, you know, his parents were idolaters. He comes from an idolatrous society. And he decides that, you know, I'm no longer going to carry that, you know, that, that into the next generation. That stops with me. Yeah. And so you'll see Ibrahim, even as a kid, you know, he, a young man, not a kid, but a young guy, and he breaks the idols, you know, as the law captures in one verse yeah. that the, they walked away and he took the hammer and he broke all of the idols, you know, and then he hung the, yeah. the hammer or the axe around the neck of the, the big idol, you know, because he's, he's making a mockery of the intellect, right? Because he's like, you know, if this, the main idol that you guys worship couldn't protect the smaller idols from being broken, yeah. Then why are you worshiping him? He can't even protect himself yeah. because I hung the axe around his neck. I could have broke him too. And this is someone that yeah. this is something that you are devoting, you know, your yourself to and making sacrifices to and supplicating to and things like that. So he's breaking this generational curse that is being passed down to him. And for many of us who've converted to Islam, you were a Catholic. I was a Christian. I was a Baptist. We we've, we've broken that generational part of that generation. My mother, my mother right? was a or your mom, man. right. You know, yeah. so we I'm the daughter some, of a revert. You are the daughter of a revert. I, I am I, I was a Baptist Christian, you know, raised from mm. the very beginning, you know, to, to accept yeah. Jesus as the Son of God. And so yeah. at some point I broke that, you know, and many people who have yeah. converted to Islam have done the same. So now let's look at that yeah. in terms of psychological or mental or uh, physical trauma that has been given to us by our parents and passed down from yes. their parents. You know, as I've stated before, my father, who's still alive, who's not Muslim, may Allah guide him. One day, uh, I was having a conversation with my father and I asked him, I said, you know, has your father ever told you? I never met my, my grandfather. My grandfather died, you know, uh, in the early 80s. I was a kid. I don't even recall or remember. Nonetheless, I asked my father, did your father ever tell you that he loved you? And he said, no. He said, my father never told me that I love you. He, you know, my, my grandfather's a war veteran, you know, World War II veteran. You know, he's been around for a while. And after he came back from the war, you know, he was, you know, much like, you know, traumatized, much like many men who came back from the war. And yes. he could not engage their families like that. And so when my father said that his father never told him he loved him, I said, well, that's very ironic. I said, because you have never told me you love me. I said, so we are going to right. I said, so we are going to break that cycle right now. And I told my father, I looked him yeah. in his face. I said, I love the you. The pain ends with you. Right. I said, I love you. Yeah. And I, and I hugged him and I braced him. And he said, now we say that on a regular basis when I just went to go visit him last weekend. You know, he's sick and I, I I went and stopped by his house to go visit him. And as I'm leaving, I said, all right, man, take care, man. I love you. You know, and he's like, I love you, too. So now this becomes something that is now normal between us. Yeah. Whereas before it was yeah. never it was never spoken. And, and my sons, yeah. I tell them that all the time. I make them uncomfortable. You know, I'm like, you know, I love you. Right. And they're like, come on, Abby, come yeah. on, man. Like that, that makes them uncomfortable. But here again, I am breaking a generational trauma or generational curse that has been passed down generations in our family yeah so it starts with you knowing your family knowing your culture the culture of your family and the things that have been passed down you know my father was a drug user all of his brothers my father has six brothers with the exception of maybe one or two of them all of them you know use and abuse drugs all of them have been to prison yeah. so that's another generational trauma generational curse i have been to prison 
I have used drugs, you know, at some point in my life when I was a teenager, you know, and then at 20 years old, when I converted to Islam, I made a conscious decision that I was not going to pass that down to my children. The buck stops and, and, here. It stops yeah. with me. And you were talking about topics that we don't want to talk about in our Muslim community, but, you know, many of our sons or children use drugs and it's like, this is coming from the wounds that yes. they, they hold. Absolutely. And it's, I mean, addiction is, is in any addiction, usually there's a, there's a place of pain, pain that, that, that person shows. And, and, it's and, like an and the addiction, and not to cut you off, and the addiction yep. can be passed down gener uh, gene uh, um, uh, genetically. It can be passed down. There's a gene that is now in, you know, when you begin to abuse a drug and use it long enough, the body becomes accustomed to it and it now becomes a part of the gene that you are passing down to the child. And so now, under, yeah. yeah, say it again. We underestimate the genetic our DNA, you know, that, that is passed on, but Allah created that DNA. Absolutely. You know, there are certain traits and things that are passed yes. on and we have As to become aware of what's been passed on. Absolutely. Absolutely. If your, your parents were drinkers, then you have a tolerance. You you have some, you know, uh, there's a port, there's a part of you. They have, in the 80s, they used to call them, and I hate using the term, crack babies. And these are children that are born to parents who were addicted to crack. And those children are born with the gene that introduces them, you know, that this child, if this child is introduced to the same drug or a drug of, you know, a, a similar component, the, the child will automatically abuse it and become addicted to it. You, you have to understand the things that we become attached to, the things with, you know, natural selection. You know, the, you put a person or human being in an environment, they adapt to that environment, and then that becomes a part of their, you know, becomes a part of their gene. So here again, think about, for example, when you eat meat, right? You eat meat. If a if a if an animal is traumatized before the animal is slaughtered, right? Which in Islam is haram, right? Think about this for a moment. If the animal is traumatized, beaten, electrocuted, whatever the case may be, there's a lot of fear. The animal knows that the animal is about to be tortured. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of things that are you know that are flowing through the blood of that animal, which is connected to the meat, right? When that animal is slaughtered and that meat is cut up and sold into the market, when you eat that meat, you are essentially putting into your body meat from an animal that was traumatized. Yeah. And to yeah. believe that like, that does yeah. not have any impact on you, you are what you eat. So if that yeah. is being passed down from an animal, you know, in terms of, of of eating the, the meat that of an animal that has been traumatized, then what about trauma that has been inflicted on us and then we turn around and have children? Yeah. That's the epigenetics, yeah. genetics of it. Yeah. It's like um, there was one saying how they talked about people, um, children or grandchildren of um, Nazi camp. You know, their grandparents had, had basically, you know, been, um, what's the word, gassed to death. They, right. could, they would have feelings of um, suffocation as a child and they didn't understand where these feelings were coming from. Yep. And so, yeah, it's, our genes do impact. So you got to think, interesting what as, as, the, as, the, as parents, of the anxiety that we experience, sometimes the fear that we experience, sometimes that stuff was passed down to us from our parents through the DNA. You take a mom, for example, who was physically abused by her husband for many years. And then that woman has children. You don't think that that child or those children from their DNA coding, you don't think that they have a share of that fear, anxiety, trepidation, all of the things that the woman was experiencing in that relationship that is passed down to the children. Uh, well, I, I was a product of that. I grew up watching my father, you know, my parents, my father was very abusive and psychologically, mentally, physically. And I, or I it took many years, many years for me to heal my fatherhood wound and mm. my my fear of men mm. in particular and i'm raising wow. five, i'm raising five sons here wow so it took a really long wow. time because so there was already this natural fear inbuilt subconsciously not that i recognized and understood that until many years later mm. and and 
you, it's, and I had to do a lot of healing work. And that's why I'm so passionate about healing. So at what point did you, messages. at what point did you recognize where, where it was coming from? When did you, at what point did you identify the source of it? I, uh, subhanAllah, at 14 years old, I realized that this was something really wrong here. I knew at 14 years old, Allah gave me that insight that this is not normal because my mother's actions and how she was, was very different to how my father was. And I just started comparing. Allah gave me that, I suppose, that insight or wisdom from a very young age that this is not normal. Mm -hmm. And my parents ended up divorcing when I was about 16. The good thing was that my mother, because she was so consciously aware, she got us all straight into counseling. So we had to, we had to unpack that at a very young age, which I think was very good because if we hadn't, I think my brothers, you know, had to go through a lot of struggles around that, especially having a father that was abusive. Um, unpacking it helped us to understand that we were not to blame. We were not to act. Because I think mm -hmm. children a lot of time from a young age, you internalize some self criticism or self blame that you are at fault or that you are not good enough. Mm -hmm. But definitely it's an area. And that's probably the biggest area that I work with, with women. I work with women who've been through childhood trauma, childhood wounds, attachment wound, and then rebuilding themselves and rebuilding the narrative. Because you, you absorb stories and narratives and ideas about yourself that are not always correct. Uh, because of that, of that past abuse, but and like you said before, building that self worthiness through the lens that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, alhamdulillah, He created us as our birthright worthy, and we all have capacity and limit um, to, to meet our. We, sorry, don't limit ourselves. We have the capacity, but it took. It's taken many years of inner healing work, and for me, particularly in the last five six years, is that really realizing. What's the messages I'm sending to my boys, mm -hmm. my sons? And I think this is a message that I see a lot in women when they, they are whole, when they haven't healed, they're holding on to some level of hate towards men or some level of dislike or there's, there's definitely some uh, trauma or perception that is kind of clouded, right? Mm -hmm. And until you heal that and realize that, alhamdulillah, Allah SWT has created many good men, um, that, that can subconsciously send a message to your son that that he is almost like creating an outcome around him that he might come out as an abuser. He's, he's going he to be like exactly this. right, exactly. Yes, mm -hmm. and that's really destructive, I think, because and I remember in my twenties, I was younger, almost like, oh no, he's you know he's hitting his brother, he's going to turn out. You know, it was almost like that thinking as a younger woman, as an inexperienced mother, that you almost have this fear. It's a parenting from a place of fear. And as I healed that and worked through that and, and did counseling and coaching and, and a lot of things and healing, especially fatherhood win, now I have a very close relationship to my father. And a lot of that came from forgiveness. And he's an old man now. He's, and I know he's in a lot of regret. And he'll send me messages, you know, he'll be like very loving messages. And it, it's taken a long time to receive that and accept that love based on what that wasn't right. as a child. Exactly. But I think this is so important because you talked about it too, about we stepping up as adults and healing our wounds and healing our relationships with our parents or the people that we we have um, unhealthy attachment with, if they're willing to, to, to reciprocate that. There's no point if the person isn't at a perception taking to be able to, right. to understand and, 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 and take that on. But I think that's so important in raising our sons because, especially as a woman, because we are that we kind of send the blueprint around what their perception of men. And I see this a lot with single mothers when they come out of these, and understandably so, when you've come through a toxic relationship or dysfunctional marriage or domestic violence, they come up and they have this hate. Yeah, towards bitterness, the resentment, and that that bitterness and resentment start the experiences that she had with that man and it, and it starts to extend innocent. to His all men right and the son is like yeah. in the middle of that and the son is fighting yes. against you know his own peer pressures his own you know wherever he is in life in addition yes. to the blanket you know outlook that his mom has on all men and so yeah that plays a huge plays a huge role which brings me to my my next point and that is that as a parent you have to know your limits meaning you have to know your strengths and acknowledge them and you have to also know your weaknesses all right and to correct your weaknesses and you don't have to have all the answers all the time the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said al mu'min al qawi khayrun wa ahabbu ila allah min al mu'min dhaif wa fi kulli khayr 
He said the strong believer is more beloved and dear to Allah than the weak believer. But in both of them is good. In both of them is good. You as a parent have to recognize your strengths and you have to recognize your weaknesses. Because yeah. when you do that, you you hone in more so on your strengths and then you defer your weaknesses to other areas, you know, or other people that can help in the areas that you're like, for example, when we start talking about when I start talking to my sons about, you know, girls or talking to them, my wife is immediately tapped out. That's not my I'm not talking to them about any of that. You do that. She's recognized that I'm not the person to talk to them about that, you know. I don't yeah, feel comfortable. You know, role. Right. I don't feel comfortable talking to my sons about their private areas and things like that. You, you do yeah. that. And so, you know, me, I'm very, you know, straight to the point that, you know, you guys, you know, for example, from the fifth row, I'm talking to them about shaving. You need to shave your underarms. You need to shave your private area. Yes. You, know, you, you shave like this. Yes. This is what you do. You know, and she walk out the room like, man, I don't want to hear that conversation. You know what I mean? But it has to be done. <laughs> grooming personal grooming these are things this is an area of weakness for her but it's an area of strength for me so you know when it so comes what would you advise sorry to interrupt but what would you advise a single mother who's not sure she wants for like, example her son to learn about um wet dreams or whatever she goes to and all that what would you advise her she doesn't have maybe there's an absent father what would you advise her in that situation uh I mean, I think that the the local mosque, uh, sometimes uh, I think we, we kind of drop the ball on that. But I think that the imam of the local masjid should have, for example, a men's group uh, where, you know, maybe the young men, a young men's group where they kind of meet, you know, or encourage one of the brothers in the community to, you know, who's upstanding, trustworthy, you know, um, to run, you know, maybe a young men's youth group where they can discuss these things. Boys need to have a space where they can have these conversations. So, for example, a group of moms may need to get together and select, you know, a good brother from the community or one of their older sons or somebody that they trust to be able to have a youth group where these things can be discussed, where they can learn about girls, they can learn about reproduction, they can learn about their private areas, they can learn about you know, love and all of those other things from a man's perspective, you know, so a men's group is something young men's group is absolutely necessary. H learn about hygiene. Absolutely. Hygiene. Young boys, especially young teenagers, they need to know and understand. I teach middle school. I walk into my sixth grade class one day and I mean, I walk into the class and I'm like, my goodness. Yeah. So whatever lesson I had prepared for that day was on the side. We talked about the whole class hygiene. My class was put on pause for the day. I walked in and I took one whiff of that classroom and I'm like, my goodness. That smell was enough. Right. I said, no, no, no. Today we are going to have a class about hygiene, personal hygiene, you know, and, you know, obviously there are certain things that boys need to hear from a man, you know, hearing it from a woman, eesh, you know, it's, it sounds a little, you know, that is, they're not going to be as receptive, uh, and hearing it from a man, you know, so I think those things are, are very important, you know, um, and another thing to, you know, for mothers is to help the boys gain their independence. I think that's very important. You got to help the young boys gain their independence. So I'm going to give you an eye. What do you mean by that? So what do I mean by that? Gain Helping young men to gain their independence, meaning so that they can learn how to make mature decisions on their own and then learn how to deal with the consequences of their own decisions without forcing the parents, because sometimes as parents will take on the guilt for them. Oh, you know, you did this and, you know, I, I think, you know, don't worry about it. No, I'm not going to take on, I'm not going to take on responsibility for the consequences of the decisions that you made. You need to be independent of me. Don't put your guilt on me. I'm not going to be guilty for you. But Teach I think them. a lot of mothers, what they do is when their child makes a mistake, their son makes a mistake, it's almost like, oh, that's, I've made a mistake. Mm -mm. Like they've taken on their child's right. mistake they tell and themselves, made it about them. They tell themselves, oh, if I would have just taught him this, or if I would have just did that, you know, then maybe he wouldn't have made that mistake. No, let him make the mistake because he's going to learn from that mistake, but he's also going yeah. to feel more confident that he was able to make that decision by himself. 
and then he deals with the dirty. Right. You made the decision by yourself and then you deal with the consequences of that. Once they get over yeah. that, they'll feel more comfortable. Wow, okay, I got through that. I can do it's that the again. Of the souls. Right. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah number four, ayah six. In Surah number four, very beautiful ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَبَتَلُوا الْيَتَامَ حَتَّى إِذَا بَلَغُوا النِّكَاحِ فَإِنْ آنَسْتُمْ مِنْهُمْ رُشْتًا فَادْفَعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ أَمْوَالَهُمْ Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about orphans, right? So for example, in that society, if a father was killed at war, the, the boy or the girl becomes an orphan, the, the son becomes yeah. an orphan, and the people who are caretakers for that, the guardians over the child... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is instructing the guardians over the orphan, test the orphan before you give them the wealth that their parents left behind for them. Test them first mm. before you give it to them. Test them to see if they are mature enough before you just go ahead and give them the money that their parents left behind. Test them <clears throat> until they reach the age of nikah. The age of nikah, Allah uses the word nikah here to talk about the age of maturity. All right? Test them until they reach the age of nikah, the age of maturity. And when you recognize from them that they have the power of decision making, right, good decision making, then give them the wealth that their parents left behind for them. So you're monitoring the child. You're testing them. You're giving them little tests. I'll give you an example, something that I do often, something I just did last weekend. So. As a public speaker, sometimes we travel around and I like to travel with my family, right? And so as my sons got older, um, it's very hard for me to have a hotel room with them and my wife and my little ones. So what I started to do at around the time that they were about nine, 10 years old, I used to get an extra hotel room next to mine or down the hall from mine for them. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. I, I, because I just, I like my space and I just don't feel comfortable with them there. And, you know, me and my wife, we want our privacy. So I would get an extra you hotel. Have boys? I have all boys except one girl. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> a lot of boys. <laughs> my, I am a boy dad. I, the, you turn the page for boy I, dad, I, I'm a, you see I'm my face. I'm a mother of five boys. So <laughs> I'm a mother of five boys. So I'm just like, yeah. I'm so, okay, so on. what I would do is I would get an extra hotel room. And, uh, you know, they would bring their Xbox with them because we're still spending the night. And then, of course, I usually try to choose a hotel that has a pool so they can go downstairs. They can go to the pool and just yeah. kind of leave me alone. You know, I, I might need to prepare yeah. my lecture. You know, I might need to go out or whatever the case may be. So what I would do is I would get them the hotel room and I would tell them, listen, I got you guys your own room. I'm going I'm testing you. This is a test. Show me that you can be mature with this room. I said, if the neighbor next door to you calls downstairs and tells them that you guys are making too much noise, if I come back in the room and I see that you guys are not up for Salat, or if I come in the room and I see that you guys have just completely destroyed the room, you will never have this again. So prove to me that you are mature enough to handle this. And alhamdulillah, throughout the years, even up until last week, I took my kids on a boys trip. We went on a boys trip. We went to American Dream Mall. They wanted to go swimming. Took them swimming. Four of them. I took the, the teenage ones. Took four of them with me. You know, this is one of the first times that we went on a boys trip and my wife or one of my families was not with me, you know, and, you know, it was very interesting, you know, but I took them, you know, this is y'all day. Took them swimming, rented a hotel room for them. And I had my own room by myself. And, um, and I told them as I got off the elevator, they were on a different floor. I said, this is your room key. This is the room that you guys are in. Show me that you guys are mature enough to handle the room. All right. I said, if they call downstairs and say, you guys are making too much noise. If I call to get you eyes up for Salah and you're not up, you're not answering your phone. This will never happen again. And so throughout the years, they have proven that they are mature enough to handle that. So now I don't, I don't, I don't have a problem with that. So when they say, you know, Abby, can we get our own hotel room? Sure. Not a problem because you have proven to me that you are mature enough to handle that. So you have to give your teenage boys, you have to give them tests. So, for example, you might say to your son, one of my sons, he wanted to go to a, a gathering that his friends was having at his friend's house. So I said, OK, I need you back here by 10 o'clock. 16, you need to be here at 10 o'clock. 
If you are not here by 10 o'clock, do not ask to go again. And he was home at 10 o'clock. You give them little tests to see if they can handle it. And when they prove to you that they are mature, don't question that. When your child has told you, for example, this is especially true for women. When your son exposed something to you that they didn't have to, when they've shown you that they are you know, honest and they've shared something with you, don't penalize them for it. Welcome the fact that they were honest with you because they didn't have to be honest with you. They didn't have to tell you. So don't penalize them and say, well, see, that's why I didn't want you to go and you're not going again. It's like, yeah, but if he texted you and told you, that means that he was being transparent with you. Yeah, you're breaking the emotional safety. He came and told you right. not to tell you the information. Exactly. You know, you're not entitled sometimes. Exactly. Some things they are going to hide. Yeah. Exactly. So you're teaching, yeah, you're creating that safe space. Also, what you're, what I'm hearing from you, you're teaching accountability. Big you're giving them little tests to see how, you, you're basically scaffolding that accountability. And as, as each time they've done that, it's almost like rewarded because then they learn, well, being responsible is worth it. There you I, go. I gain, I'm gaining something. There you go. And the greatest thing yeah. that a boy, one of the main things that a boy wants from his father is acknowledgement that he measures up as a young man. Every boy wants that from their father. They want to know from their dad that I measure up in your eyes as a man. And so the more and more tests you give them and the more and more you acknowledge the fact that they are mature, boys hate to be called immature. When you call a boy immature, it shrinks him. It makes him feel like all of what he's building has now been crushed. So when you make a boy feel like, hey, you've made a very mature decision, you know, I, I see you growing, I see you maturing. In his mind, he starts to believe that the image that he's building is working for him. And the one thing that you don't want to do as a mother, as a single mom, you don't want to destroy that. Your, your greatest leverage is how you see him as a man. That's your greatest leverage. I found that dealing with my sons, one of the most powerful things that I can say to them is that I'm disappointed in you. I'm disappointed. Yeah. In you. That is even yeah. more effective than maybe, you know, yoking them, grabbing them up or, you know, getting in their face and being a little bit more aggressive with them. What is even more impactful is to let them know that you let me down. I saw you here, as the Arabs say, suck at them in Aini. I saw you here, but I actually see you here now. Yeah, and not in a not in a shaming way, right. in a way that kind of induced a bit of guilt, and they realize, you know, I've just lost a little bit of that respect. Right. But I wanted to ask you, ask you in regards to the mother son relationship. The son is being quite disrespectful to the mother. What do you think is important for the mother in her own self respect? She's putting up the disrespect because I see this a lot in coaching. I see this with women who have teenage boys that, as long as the father's disrespectful or the, as a, just the, um, not the absent father's disrespectful, whatever. Right. So the son actually is being disrespectful. He's an older teenage boy, right? right? He's being more disrespectful. What do you feel for her, for her sake? What do you think is important for her to maintain in when she's putting up with this disrespect? Like, what do you think is, is, because for women as a mother, sometimes she just, she's lost her power in some ways or she feels like she doesn't know how to stand up to it. What do you think is important for her to maintain in regards to her older teenage boy that's disrespecting her? Very good. Very good. I'm glad you asked this question. So for moms, single moms that are dealing with teenage boys right now that seem to be very disregarding, dismissive and disrespectful, right? One of the things I want you to understand is that part of the reason why you feel like you have lost control and you have no more control and this young boy doesn't respect you. Part of that reason is because of the way that you've taught the child how to engage you. And I'm almost positive that the way that the child disrespects you is in many instances the same way that his father used to disrespect you. And so the lesson is just continuously repeating itself because you didn't learn the lesson. The first thing that you have to understand is that you teach people how to treat you. Your child did not come out the womb disrespecting you. There was somewhere along the journey in your relationship with that child where you gave the child the green light to disrespect you.
Mm, something, some indication, some green light you gave him, whether knowingly or unknowingly, that I will tolerate this behavior. You have to be able to set boundaries, not just with your child, but with anybody. You teach people how to treat you. When you start working on a job, you come in fresh. Nobody knows you. Nobody knows, you know, the parameters and how to deal with you. You set yeah. the tone from the very beginning of how you want to be engaged. So if you tolerate a behavior once, twice, then you've now taught them that that is okay. It's like you're being fooled, you're right. not but you're not having self-respect. Right. And you've got to take that back for yeah. them to realize, wait a minute, mom's not going to put up with this. There you go. You have to set yeah. boundaries. And then there has to be consequences when the person crosses that boundary. Maybe the first time yeah. there's a warning, like, hey, I told you before, you know, yeah. don't raise your voice at me. I want you to be mindful yeah. of your tone of voice when you're talking to me. I'm your mother. I'm not one of your friends. All right. That's yeah. that's that's your first warning. The yeah. next time that happens and you might don't steal the fact here again that maybe he's upset. Hey, I understand you're upset. I understand yeah. that you're angry, but I need you to pause for a moment and think about who you're talking to. I am not one of your friends. I am not yes. trying to take away the fact that you're angry. You're angry. You're upset. I get it. But at the same token, because you're angry does not give you the right to be disrespectful. Did I, did I disrespect you? No, I didn't disrespect you. All right. Even yeah. when I'm angry with you. So now you're showing him, you're mirroring to him that you don't do the thing that he is doing to you. That when I'm angry and upset with you, I never disrespect you. I never call you out your name. I never shout at you. I never, you know, use profanity. That's, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I expect to have the healthy relationship with that. Because if you're not, you're not showing up in your healthy self. If you're reacting, reacting, you're emotionally abusive. You're using spiritual abuse. You're saying, you know, you're going to go to Jahannam. And you're saying all these negative things or putting them down. Don't expect then that child's going to turn around a young man and then keep respecting you. It just Absolutely. ends up this power struggle that's just. Really unhealthy. You fun. are you are demanding reciprocity. You are demanding reciprocity. I'm not asking you. I'm demanding it because I don't talk to you that way when I'm angry and upset with you. So I expect the same engagement that I give you. Treat others how you want to be treated. That's part of our dean. Number two yeah. is that once he crosses that boundary, there has to be some level of consequence. I don't, when I say mm -hmm. consequences, I don't necessarily mean putting your hands on him physically, but consequences yeah. like I'm going to take something away from you. A privilege that I granted to you before is something that I'm now going to take away from you because you violated, mm -hmm. you violated the sanctity of my personal space. The boundaries I, that I'm I smiling set. Because, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm smiling because this happened with my 18 year old yesterday. So he was a bit disrespectful. And then he afterwards like, mom, can you take me to work? And I said, no. And then he said, why? And I'm like, because you, you can't just disrespect me and then come and ask me for a favor and I'll take you to work. And we had this conversation and he realized. And afterwards, my husband came to me and goes, Khadija, it's good. I could, you know, you stood up for yourself. You had to, you know, and you, he's not going to disrespect you now. So it's, it, I, I get what you're saying, but yep. obviously that's also that self-awareness. And also I've, I've worked through a level of self-respect and self-worthiness to know that. To so know not to tolerate that. that. Absolutely. Yes. Well, my 14 yes. year old, my, my 16 year old, he works for the summer. And uh, my wife was taking him to work early in the morning, which she's not necessarily a morning person, but she gets up and she takes him to work. And uh, so he's like, you know, the entitlement, you know, uh, you, you're, you're going to make me late. You're going to make me late and we have to be there at this time. And she's like, dude, I'm doing you the favor. Like, I, I get it. You want to get to work on time. But, you know, I'm struggling through a lot. You know, I got a newborn. I got an 18 month old. And, you know, I'm trying to get him squared away so I can get in the car and get, you know, I'm moving yeah. as fast as I can. And you're being here. Considerate. Right. Being very inconsiderate. So she said, you know what? I'm not taking you to work anymore. You can catch the bus. So now you got to get up 45 minutes earlier. You got to get to the bus stop and then you got to wait an hour on the bus to get to your job. You know, so now you deal with the consequences of that. And I'm, yeah. I'm telling him, like, don't look at me. I'm not taking you because you need to take the bus anyway so that, you know, standing at the bus stop and, you know, catching the bus and, you know, being late for the bus and missing the bus and trying to figure it out. That's all a part of that's your what development. Responsibility. There you go.
That's all. But you had it good for the for the first month that you were working until you begin to, you know, criticize and critique your mom. And never once did you tell her thank you. Never once did you say, Mom, I do understand that you get up early to take me to work. I do appreciate you. You never once got paid and said, Mom, let me treat you to breakfast. You know what I mean? Let me just tell you thank you. Mom, let me put some gas in your car. You get paid and, you know, you want to go spend your money. You want to go do whatever yeah. it is. You, you yeah. know, and now he had to learn a hard lesson. A hard yeah. lesson. And, yeah. and I'm and I'm glad she did that. I'm like, all right, you stood up for yourself. Great. Because he definitely wouldn't have tried it with me. But that's the difference between the boys and their relationship with their moms. And I'm like, you know, he looking yeah. at me like, are you going to take me? To, I'm not taking you to work. No. Yeah. <laughs> Not yeah. gonna happen. So for, for for us women then to know if we're ever in that dynamic where the son is being disrespectful to self respect our first for so first and foremost, I think a lot of mothers put up with it because they have this idea that, you know, the child has an entitlement, right? And she just uh, is soft and kind, but that's still, when you're complacent with that, you're not setting a message to him. You're setting your, his relationship with you, you're the first female in his life. You're the first female in his life. And so, so you are going, you. you are going to set the tone for how he engages women afterwards. 100%. Uh, so it becomes, it, it's, 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 it, it is critical that a mom set boundaries with her son. Not just set boundaries, but there has to also be consequences when he violates those boundaries. It can't be, oh, yeah. don't talk to me like that. And, but then when he does, there's, there's no consequence afterwards. There has to be yeah. consequences and you have to be transparent about them. Like as a teacher, when we start teaching at the beginning of the school year, there's what are called classroom rules. Yeah. And there's agreements. So. Right. There's a yeah. classroom rule. There's agreements that, hey, I'm not going to talk when the teacher is talking. I'm and not going to do it free. Right. And what sets the teacher aside from the children disregarding those rules and children that follow those rules? Sometimes I walk into a classroom and I'm looking at the teacher like, what in the heck are you doing? Because I need to do what you're doing because these kids follow the rules in this classroom. And then you walk into another classroom and it's just complete chaos. And what separates the teacher whose classroom ends up being chaos by the middle of the school year and what teacher who consistently you know gets the same respect every single day when she walks into her classroom is how you reinforce those rules the rules are there in so both you classrooms learn the expectations yeah. there are rules in yeah. both classrooms but the results of those rules differ from classroom to classroom and that all depends yeah. on how you follow up those rules when those rules are violated when those rules are, you know, infringed upon and how the consequences that you set. And obviously the consequences should be commensurate with the infraction. Like you shouldn't punish the child, you know, for an infraction that was, you know, give them a major punishment for a minor infraction. Even in yeah, our religion, some, yeah. even in our religion, we have major sin, minor sin. And there's certain ways yeah. to atone for your major sin, certain ways to atone for your minor sins. Um, and the yeah. same way, you know, the same thing works with how we engage our children. Sister Khadija, this has been a very, very, you know, interesting yeah, so conversation, say, but I have to, I have to go. Um, it's 12 o'clock and I have some things I need to take care of. It's midnight here, so I definitely have to go. I, so, I for good, Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much um, for... This will for, be recorded for those that keep asking. Alhamdulillah, will be recorded. Alhamdulillah, Jazakallah so much. I think that this was very beneficial and really appreciate you sharing your insights around um, raising boys, Alhamdulillah. I, wanna, I cool. wanted to introduce the... Uh, so I have a book. It's called Blended Families. If anybody is interested in this book, it's called Blended Families. And in one of my chapters... Uh, I, and here again, we're talking about step parenting. This this whole book is about step parenting and how to step parent, and you know what are some things that we need to be aware of of children who are you know children of divorce or children you know that are being you know guarded by someone who is not their biological parent. Very important. Uh, and I also have a chapter in here where I talk about the different styles of parenting, you know, different parenting styles. And it's very important, you know, for people to be aware of their parenting style. You know, are you a passive parent? Are you authoritative, uh, authoritative parent? You know, um, so I t chapter five is called Domestic Guidelines for e Effective Step Parenting. And I talk about, you know, guidelines in which you can abide by, all from Quran and Sunnah, 
uh, how to parent effectively dealing with stepchildren. And it, it applies also to, um, you know, biological children as well. You can purchase the book directly from me. You can uh, email me, Imam, Imam Muhammad at gmail.com. Uh, we haven't put the books up on our website yet, but you can purchase the book directly from me. Uh, and, and the book is called, uh, what's the book called again? Blended bl Families? Blended Families. Uh, yeah. An Islamic so, Approach to Unconventional Family Structures. Mm, um, my um, Three of my boys have been raised by their stepfather for the last seven years. Yeah. He's doing yeah. a really good job, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So, so, so interesting. If you can purchase your book. Jazakallah so much Ayakul. for looking at sharing a raw, you know, all the different areas around intergenerational trauma, building our boys up, you know, I'll record this and, and keep it, inshallah. And whoever's here and found it beneficial, please share the khair. And also, um, you can jump onto, um, um, either of our pages, inshallah, and benefit. And I really will put the link in for the conversations of, from the Quran because that was a really good series that you did in Ramadan, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. Okay, Jazakallah, khair, everyone. Okay, Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa And our presentations from the Quran because that was a really good series that you did in Ramadan, mashallah. Okay, so Alhamdulillah, that's it on that conversation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. You guys have it streamed here on uh, Facebook. So if you want to go back and listen to the recording again, you can also go to Sister Khadija's page on Instagram and she has it saved on her page. So you can go there and listen to it again if you would like. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all for taking time out of your morning to listen. Uh, and don't forget today is Tuesday. So tonight at 6 p.m. inshallah, we will be reading from the book, The Revolution of Love. The Revolution of Love, A Man's Perspective on Loving Multiple Women in a Non-Traditional Marriage. All right. So that's 6 p.m. tonight, inshallah ta'ala. If you have the book, then you are free to, um, you know, listen along. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all. Jazakum Allah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.